the world's gone mad. The ideologies are bad, but the people are glad because there's irreverent to be had. Welcome along to another episode of Irreverent with me, the Reverend Jamie Franklin. And joining me this week, it is my colleague Clark in Holy Orders, the man, the legend. It is Thomas Pelham. Tom, welcome to the show. And in a word, how excited are you for this episode? Very. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Well, I, 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 you, you're, always, you're always oozing enthusiasm, Tom, and the, 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 the sense of expectation is palpable, I must say. Well, it's good to see you in your blue clergy shirt, um, something that, that all your listeners are missing out on. Um, but yeah, no, great to have you, Tom. And also joining us today, back by popular demand, and I mean this because we receive lots of emails from people saying, where's Daniel? Daniel's not here this week. Where's he gone? So I'm delighted to... Welcome back to the show, Daniel French, saviour of the West Country ecclesiastical scene. Daniel, same question to you. How excited are you for this episode of Irreverent? Well, now I'm out of Dalek's den. Uh, <laughs> very excited. Very, very excited. excited. I think it's my programme today. There's a lot to, to look at, isn't there? Um, there is so much to talk about. There's almost no time for any banter at all. Um, I've got a question for you chaps. Um, the government have told us that we're allowed to hug our loved ones now on the on May 17th, so not before, no hugging, before 17th of May. So my question to you is, who are you going to hug first on May 17th? Any thoughts? Uh, do you know what, Jamie, I, I'm pretty much convinced that it's only ever been guidance about hugging. So I've, I've actually been hugging whoever I like through, through the entire pandemic I uh, because I treat the government's guidance in the same way I treat its guidance to eat five a day. Yep. Um, you know, it's, it's simply just that they would like us to do it. If they want us to do it, they can make it law, but they never actually did because it would be absurd to make a law banning hugging and they would go down in the history books in 400 years time. Like a bit like Oliver Cromwell banning Christmas, the Tory government of 20, 20 whatever it is banning it's not a very Tory, it's not a very Tory thing to do and and you, speaking of five a day by the way and this is going to infuriate some of our listeners but um and i don't worry i'm not going to start talking about cereal again but um i've started <laughs> eating i've started eating really high protein high fat breakfasts um really? like for example yesterday i had a steak and two boiled eggs for breakfast is this ever since that comment on youtube that said you're a bit like thin looking no no that was somebody telling me to do powerlifting. Um, yeah, yeah. He oh, yeah. Said, yeah, he said I'm a p potentially a r impressive representative of the church. But <laughs> I needed to do <laughs> I needed to do some power lifting first. Which I think which I think is is probably true, Jamie. You are a bit weedy actually. You look like you blow away in the wind. Is, I have you know, to say that the clergy shirts I wear are actually quite big. If they were a bit more tightly fitted, you'd be able to see more of a more of a muscular uh, <laughs> you got to, you're Captain America <laughs> under there, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but let me tell you about this steak and eggs. I mean it was amazing, honestly. So I normally eat cereal and often get really tired sort of mid morning. I think it because it gives you a short, sharp kind of burst of energy. But with the steak and eggs, I didn't feel hungry all morning and i had loads of energy and uh I, I can't eat steak every day because i think it would probably be um a misallocation of of my stipend but um i mean it was it was quite incredible so i'm just going for eggs now in the morning eggs and um and toast with butter on it but that that's actually significantly better than um than cereal so um yeah so there we go um yeah as i said i don't want to get sidetracked with that but but that five a day that whole five thing a day thing i'm, I'm pretty i'm pretty skeptical about that i think i think the best thing to do is just to eat, eat as much um steak and, and eggs and fatty food <laughs> well, do you well. know what jamie i mean if the old you know saying that you are what you eat is true yes i mean steak's basically grass isn't it um, um is it uh, isn't it isn't it steak made out of cows Yes, and what are cows made out of? Oh, I see what you mean. I see you're sort of tracing the. Uh, but then, what does grass eat? <laughs> the sunlight. Ooh. Ah, so we're all basically sunlight then. We're all basically so we're beginning to sound like Valentinus here. We end up eating cucumbers or something in pursuit of holiness. That is the uh, not Valentinus, of course. Those scholars of the th third century Christianity go. I don't know it what is you're talking the, um, about, John. I'm talking. Do you know? It's the um. It's the famous. It's the uh, Augustine, the sect he joined. Um, oh, they, the, is it? Are you uh, these Manichaeans. Manichaeans used to eat yeah. cucumbers. They considered them to be holy. Oh yeah, um, because they were some. They were like a source of spiritual enlightenment. Because, yeah, exactly. Because yeah, they yeah. believed that they were they were transcending from physical bodies into sort of spiritually enlightened bodies through the yeah. eating of fruits that contained light. 
this, is, this is a bit rude, Tom, but you've you've made me you've made me think of it. Did you ever watch that that show called Grumpy Old Men, where there were you know a bunch of kind of um, celebrity grumpy old men just moaning about things? It was it was actually a really good it was actually a really good show. But do you remember that guy Rory McGrath? Um, he, he was on sort of um, I wouldn't expect you to know Tom because you don't you don't know, you don't know anything. But, um, he was, uh, he was, I just remember this one where I'm sorry this is a bit rude. You can mute this for ten seconds if you if you don't like you know mildly rude words. But um, he said um, he said you know that thing about you are what you eat. You know that if that if that's true does that mean that Andrew Lloyd Webber eats assholes? I thought that was I thought it was quite amusing. Do you know who Andrew Lloyd Webber is? Tom? I do. I do. He's a musician uh, of sorts. Um, I, I, I hasten to add, sorry, I don't think that about Andrew Lloyd Webber. I don't think actually, that. Actually, I actually quite like his musicals. I do just don't, I don't know why he singled him out like that. It's a bit mean, he, isn't it? Of all I the people. I think he got an unfair ticket. No. I think that's wrong, and I I apologise to Andrew Lloyd Webber for for having brought that up. If he if he yeah. indeed listens to this show, uh, which he may do. You never know. He, he could write a theme tune. Actually, during the first lockdown, he was making those quite good videos. I watched one of them where he would take a song and then he'd do different arrangements with it. So he did one with um, uh, Get Lucky by Daft Punk. He did a number of like a ballroom version and, uh, you know, a version in, in three, four time and like a jazz version and things like that. It was quite good. Um, do you know who Daft Punk are, Tom? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. They're yeah. an 80s electric kind of punk band, aren't they? They're 80s. They've only just split up. They've been around... They were, they're more like, I think they're more like early 90s and they just oh, yeah, okay. I thought they were I thought they were founded in the 80s they have a sort of 80s aesthetic to them don't they um, no talking, talking of musicians a uh, favourite musician at the moment Roger Daltrey is, is declaring war on, on the woke generation is of he, the what's who he, what, what's he done oh I, I think he's just been grumpy at them really but I mean uh, the I mean he's basically he's basically geriatric these days isn't he bless him uh, but I think um, you know there are quite a few you know of those of that era um who are coming out as quite firmly anti-woke and anti-lockdown because that was an era of real risks, you know. There was an era where, you know, you, you didn't worry about offending people. Uh, you, you just sung what you wanted to and, uh, you know, and made, made a bit of a splash, you know, smashed up guitars on stage, um, things like that. That's what rock, that's what rock bands ought to do. Uh, nowadays, um, they don't do that. Rock and roll is about rebellion. It's, it is. It's not about conformity. And yeah, you're right, because we've had uh, Mick Jagger... Um, Eric Clapton. Yeah. Um, I think, unfortunately, Paul Van, Van Morrison. I think Van Morrison. Yeah, Van Morrison. Yeah, Paul McCartney's fallen in with it all. He's, he's. he's of course, he has. He was he, never he, rock and roll, though, was he? He's the Beatles. They're just like you know, sort of lounge no, pop, aren't they? No, 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 no. That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, your opinions are absurd. Sorry about yeah, this. Rod, yeah, Rod Stewart come down here um, quite often. Really? Uh, yeah, he's got a. Um, Penny Lancaster has a very good friend of hers who. Hmm lives a few doors up the road oh really and, um yeah I, I did a wedding where um he was um on the front row no way really uh, uh and i can still remember m my dear wife who was running the um gospel choir at the time i could feel like her laser eyes going into the back of my neck yeah as, as i said at the beginning of the service she, she wasn't in a dalek costume was she no no no, no. Just, i think she was about to kill me because I, <laughs> I said you know there's quite a lot of musicians here today I, there's there's a harpist there's a school choir gospel choir and there's probably you know the occasional there's probably the odd aged rock star and the words <laughs> came out before my brain kind of filtered <laughs> Frances kind of knew that I was, she could kind of feel that I was going to say something stupid like this. Oh my goodness. Um, and um, Aging rock star. Aging, like, yeah, aging like rock something star. Out of, uh, that's like something out of This Is Final Tap. <laughs> anyway, he came <laughs> up to me at the end. Washed up rock star. <laughs> <laughs> he came up to the end, up to me at the end. And he was really, he was uh, really gracious actually and said, um, oh, you, you know, you, you're a very cheeky little vicar, aren't you? And, uh, <laughs> 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 and I was able to tell him because um, a few months before we'd had a funeral where and it's the only time I've ever done this and um, these are the days when, when we used to play CD music you know now it's all on iPhones at the end of say the end of a service you know, someone wants to wanted to go out to whatever and um, uh, this particular funeral they were going to go out to Sailing by Rod Stewart oh yeah so um, uh, 
I left the CD somewhere, I couldn't find it. I had a complete blind panic. Um, we tried to download the music, but this is in the days of really bad broadband. This is about eight, nine years ago. So that, that flopped. We got about 10 minutes to go before the funeral. Um, so the then organist says, well, if you can download the sheet music, I'll have a go on the organ. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, which is what happened. And uh, at the end, the family came and said, oh, that was inspired that you oh, wow, know, played on the organ. It was just so wonderful. Oh, wow. uh, and um, yeah, I said, yeah, 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 I got all of it. yeah. So, anyway, so I told him, I said, I told him this story, this yarn, and said, um, and our organist um, plays better than you sing. So there you are. <laughs> <laughs> but he's really, he's, he's great fun, actually. He's, uh, it's, he's round here every few years and he goes into all the shops. He, you know, he's totally user friendly with people. Yeah. yeah. Very, very at ease. You, you, you know, you could go and so have a pint with him and it would be, it would be fun. Be, yeah. Know. Yeah. We have, we, we have our own celebrities wandering around here. And, uh, um, what's his name? Um, the, uh, it, you know, what? I'm used to the names. This is it. Um, this is I'm what I take. <laughs> it's a footballer. It used to be, used it to be. Um, to what Daniel just shared. This is very poor. <laughs> What's very poor. Um, we have worked out some male footballers. So. Do you know what? No, no, he's, he used to be manager of the Cherries of Bournemouth. Um, you're, and thinking, you're talking about Harry Redknapp. Harry Redknapp, that's the name. Um, the thing is, I had no idea who he was when I moved here. And so when he was introduced to me, I put my hand up and said, uh, put my hand out, you know, said, Hi, I'm Tom, what's your name? And he just looked at me, he gave me that look. Uh, <laughs> he found it quite amusing, actually. What did he say? Uh, probably thought, God bless him. <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite happy actually. I imagine it's quite wearying to be recognised everywhere. Um, a simple vicar. We, we had a we had a member of One Direction in town Ooh. a couple of weeks ago. Did you get them all in Southcombe? Do you? That's yeah, we do. Right? Yeah, it, it's become a bit celebrity central and that. And um, uh, Niall from One D was here, which was really <laughs> rather kind of uh, it was really surreal because my my daughter had us. You know, six foot cardboard cut out of them for a few <laughs> years until my son and best friend um, used it for football practice. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah, she went and got a selfie with him. He, he was lovely and gracious, and, you know, but she was completely thrilled and said, you know, oh, you know, I, I could die now, Dad, sort of thing, you know. Oh, wow. This, this wow moment. So her favorite pop star. Okay. And then in, in the evening, we were out in the garden and realised we could hear Irish voices um, across the road and um, he clearly was renting the house next to us. So uh, Was he singing with some other Irish people then? Is he Irish? Yes, he's Irish, yeah. So he was sort of sit having a sing-song, wow. Well, he, just, he just rented a house for, for the weekend, so... Yeah. Uh, wow. so which, which one is he in One Direction? I have no idea. Oh, 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 you don't know about One Direction? No. Oh, there's there's no there's no point going to that level of detail about One Direction. I've got them. I've got a picture of them up uh, on. I'm just trying to get into the moment. Um, no, no, Tom. Just it's no, not it's not becoming. It's not becoming for for a man, orders, no. a man of the cloth to be to be this interested in One Direction. I've no idea. I've, I just I'm not that. I mean, which which direction? Is the question I would ask. Well, um, yeah. Exactly. Which direction is this podcast going in, Jay? Well, come on now. Right, we, no, we I, said will we had... bring, I will bring direction. Right. Anyway, so uh, what I thought we'd do is just have a little sort of, um, we'll a little skip over a few uh, topics here um, because we've got so much to talk about this week. And I thought it'd be good to just talk about a little bit about news stuff. So there were obviously some elections last week, weren't there? Which basically, I think the, the basic takeaway of that is that the, all the people who were, uh, incumbents basically all did very well. So the Tories did well. Uh, Sadiq Khan did well. Um, our, our friend um, uh, Lawrence Fox uh, did pretty badly, I think, in the London mayoral election. Um, so the elections basically mean that uh, the Tories have, have simply strengthened their grip on power, which I don't think is a bit of a uh, any anything of a surprise. I don't know if you chaps have any reflections on 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 the elections, or have you followed them at all? I think we didn't have them down here because obviously different bits of the country do them at different times. But, uh, do you know, um, I, I'm honestly, you, your choice is the Tory government who at least got a roadmap out of lockdown. And then you've got Labour who, who, who don't really have anything to say about lockdown other than maybe we should have done it earlier and more. Yeah, uh, sure more of it, yeah. 
or, or the Lib Dems who who are a bit of a busted flush in the country as a whole and sort of had had a bit of a, a bit of a moment or two of, of rebelling against uh the the lockdown legislation they all voted against it back when they passed the extension of the coronavirus act um which is good uh because it's the first time i've ever seen the liberal democrats do anything that's actually liberal um but at the same time you know who does one vote for at this point um there's obviously a lot of feeling still in uh in the the, the sort of north uh, and midlands uh, and those traditional Labour heartlands that Labour just aren't listening to them, which is completely fair enough because all Labour listen to is Twitter. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I'm not surprised, although um, I'm obviously disappointed. Um, but whilst the furloughs on, whilst that sort of stuff's happening, then people are going to be insulated from the horror that the Tory government has visited upon this country. So got, we've just <coughs> got to wait. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a mixture of things, isn't it? I mean, there's the furlough issue, and then there's the fact that the Tories have spent literally hundreds of millions of pounds promoting uh, what their policies, is, yeah, yeah, which is what is essentially a political message, right? It's done in the, it's done in the name of public health, but it's still, it's still a party political broadcast for the Tories, isn't it? And they've, they've, they've recently earmarked, I think it's another 320 million pounds for further messaging which is um, just a sort of fear-mongering propaganda, really. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't really surprise me uh, very much. Um, speaking of which, um, I had an email today from the Right Honourable Michael Gove, MP, who is the uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. You may have... Have you heard of Michael Gove, Tom? He's one you... I, I have, yeah. He was once, he was once, a, uh, once, in faith, once against vaccine passports, wasn't he? Uh, you know, he, 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 was. he was against passports in general, but these yeah. days he's uh, again, yeah. Well, let me so this, ID cards, yeah. He was against ID cards, yeah, not passports. I assume he's in favor of passports, but um, as most people are, I think. Well, it's another, it's another debate, isn't it? I've never really thought about it anyway. Uh, yeah, Michael Gove wrote back to me personally, um, as a representative of the um, the, the old uh, vaccine passport letter we wrote. Uh, to tell the government that we're not having any of this. We don't want any of this down with this sort of vaccine passport thing, we're not having this in the church. Uh, so he's written, it's interesting because it's all, it's all typed out, except for my name. He's underlined the word temporary in a very sort of haphazard, not straight way. And then the date just says May 2021. And he's written, he's written um, an 11 in, like two strokes. But it just looks really, really untidy. It looks like you know he's just he's just I just don't know what's going on there. It's like he panicked. It's like, oh, there's there's no there's no actual day there. Anyway, so um, dear Dr. Franklin, thank you for your letter of 14th of April concerning COVID status certification. First, allow me to express my gratitude for your thorough and thoughtful letter on behalf of yourself and your colleagues. I understand your concerns, and I hope this response will assuage them. Well, we'll see, Michael, we'll see. The government believes COVID status certification could have a role to play both domestically and internationally as a temporary measure. And that's the, the word temporary, he's underlined. So he's typed this all out and then he's underlined it because he's so, he's so adamant that it's only temporary. We are currently reviewing whether COVID status certification could play a role in reopening our economy. Hasn't he just said that? Reducing restrictions on social contact and improving safe, safety. We are, however, clear that there are some settings and services such as essential retail and public transport where we believe COVID status certification should not be required. With regard to your concern about vaccine passports, any certification scheme would take into account vaccination testing or natural immunity status. Work is ongoing with a range of groups as we consider all the evidence. And then he links to a, a ministerial statement. So, um, yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it? He says it would be temporary, and he says that there are some settings and services, such as essential retail and, and public transport, which would be uh, where that would not be uh, appropriate. He doesn't actually mention the church. Which yeah, it's a weird, isn't it? In a personal letter, not to mention the one thing that the focus is uh, on, is it? Uh, probably written by an intern, really. So <laughs> <laughs> everything is these days, yeah. Uh, and, and you can imagine him pacing at high speed down some corridor, sort of yeah. signing it. Along yeah. with a whole load of other things, uh, you know, in the court of the Duchy of Lancaster, um, <laughs> he didn't mention he didn't mention his apparent little trip to Israel with no. I, I can't say Van Dam, but it's Van Tam. <laughs> not, <laughs> it's not action movie. His his trip to have a look at how they're running it there. 
Yeah, well, he doesn't. Well, he doesn't mention Jean Claude Van Tam and uh, their their trip to uh, to the to Israel. Um, you, you shared that that um, remarkable piece about the um, was it about Easter at the um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Israel? Oh uh, yeah, it's were... exactly exactly what we feared, isn't it? This here we have a a vaccine only service. Yeah, oh, vaccine um, part, people needed their vaccine passport to get into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Was it, was it for the Easter Vigil, Daniel? I can't remember. Mm. Yes, it was. It's the one with the, the Holy Fire. Mm. Yes, yeah. Miraculous yeah. Holy Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you're only allowed the Holy Fire if you've been vaccinated uh, yeah. in, in Israel. So let's. So um, mm. there aren't sort of safeguards around things like uh, essential retail and, and public transport as there are with, with uh, religious freedoms. So I guess we're going to have to... We're going to have to hope that um, that this includes, you know, this sort of exemption about ex essential retail and public transport will also include um, uh, churches and things like that as well. Although this uh, remains to be seen, doesn't it? And I, I hasten to add, I don't really believe any of this. Uh, you know, he's you know what? Yeah. three weeks to flatten the curve, isn't it? So yeah, 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 exactly. As as also with all these things, it's so likely that it's, it's given given the, the the reaction to various churches to the COVID measures that they they end up self, uh, you know, applying this anyway, um, and, yeah. and uh, even if not forced to, uh, you know, obviously not no church that I'm a member of will ever do that, but uh, I could see, you know, those churches that have gone above and beyond what's required of them, and yeah. there are many many hundreds of them. Why, why wouldn't they, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. there was a picture well, that went round last week about, a ch I think it may have been in DC, where a church has divided the seating into the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. Males yes. and female, yeah. slave and free. Vax yeah. and vax, unvaccinated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. Step in the right direction. Yeah, very good. Uh, you know, you could. Uh, I saw it and thought, oh, please, someone take this image down before <laughs> COVID enthusiastic get an idea. Because you can see how some people might go down that line. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, cr crazy. Yeah. Well, Gove, uh, thanks, Michael Gove, for um, getting in touch. It's, it's nice to receive an email from uh, to my, a letter. From a letter. A letter from, yeah it is a letter it's, it's i mean it's not a printed letter it's a it's a scanned letter but um are you going to frame it somewhere oh yeah i could take it down and, and put it in a frame yeah thanks um thanks michael it's good to hear from you and uh, i hope that this is i hope that this doesn't happen at all but um if it does then we've obviously got the words here that this is a temporary measure so when we're all living in a in a world where we can't go out of our house unless we've had certain vaccines and uh where women's um ovulation is being monitored in order to make sure they don't get pregnant all this kind of stuff we can produce this letter and we can say michael you said this was temporary and then uh you know then nothing then we'll be thrown into some kind of I don't know about I don't know about ovulation, Jamie, but I do know I, you you can see it sort of, you know, being tied into things like other recommendations, couldn't you? Sort of five a day, things like that. You know, have you have you been to the supermarket and bought your allocated amount of fruit? And you know, have you been to the gym enough times? Have you, you know, how many times have you been to the restaurant? You 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 go to the restaurant three times in a week. Well, that's you know, yeah. Too well, much it's, we're going to cut your credit. You know. Have it's you not the, the, the CCP, film, it's the Chinese, Chinese yeah, Communist yeah. Party uh, policy, seen, so it'll probably be adopted here tomorrow, I don't know. It, um, well, it could be. Have you seen the film The Island? Have you seen that film? Uh, Michael Bay, The Island. I I no, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that you haven't seen it, Tom, but I mean, it's an awful film. It's absolutely terrible. It's, one, it's an awful film. But the first, the first part of it is quite interesting because they're, it's, it's set in the future and they're in some kind of you know, some kind of colony, you don't really know what it is, but their lives are being totally controlled. And one of the things that happens to the characters is there's some kind of, some kind of machine that scans them for, you know, their, you know, their vital, um, um, I don't know what's, basically they can tell how much nutrients they've got in their body and all this kind of stuff. And it, it, they get scanned by this machine and then the food is a portion for them based on, you know, what, what state they're in. So they can't have bacon, for example, if they're, um that you know their their um cholesterol is too high or yeah, their cholesterol is too high or something like that you can tell i'm not a doctor or, or a scientist can't you the way i'm describing this but essentially like that's the that's that that could be the future couldn't it if, if there is some kind of machine or some kind of 
thing that you have to scan yourself into and then it can tell you know your cholesterol or your blood sugar, definitely... all of this kind of stuff and then there's a then there's then there's a little drone that comes from amazon and it just hovers over your house and drops your appoint apportioned food for the day <laughs> is this where one day they find dr franklin on the floor Forging on coconut pops. <laughs> I, stowed away. House I, I stowed away in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> in anticipation of this um, happening. You, know, you can you can you can definitely imagine some of the public health sort that are currently running in this country, you know, gleefully adopting that sort of thing. It's one of the reasons why you shouldn't give them anywhere near anything that looks like power. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately we have a weak willed government that, that has yeah done that absolutely and I, I agree i agree in other in other big news before we get to the um scripture section of our podcast did you chap see the uh, the masked uh, gargoyle and i was i was thinking oh. of doing, i was thinking of doing a joke here but i'm not going to right it's, it's too obvious uh, did you see the the masked gargoyle the stone masked gargoyle did you did you see that then what, what was yeah. your view on it what was your view because to be honest with you, so this is a this is a this is a um, a masked gargoyle uh, in stone, which is in a shrine in um, St Albans Cathedral. Is it is it the shrine of St Alban? I don't I don't know. Um, but anyway, the stonemason made it over the past over the past year, and um, I actually think I I have to say that I'm not against this this sort of thing because cathedrals are meant to reflect. Um, the sort of they're supposed to be a kind of microcosm of all of all of reality right so that's why you get sort of um you know flora and fauna in in um in uh, cathedrals and and animals and, and human beings and creatures and demons and gargoyles and everything like that it's because it's meant to represent it's meant to be a kind of pictorial representation of of the invisible and the visible realms um so i i've got no i've got no not necessarily any problem with with a um a gargoyle wearing a mask because it, it seems to me to be quite fitting um with that kind of tradition i mean obviously i don't like masks and everything like that but that's not really the point it's that uh, the, the point are... of gar the point of gargoyles is to be horrifying and frightening isn't it so yeah. i think masks are probably quite appropriate on them you mask them all uh, it's probably all right though jamie because have we checked whether the the, the stonemason was woke enough i mean well we will probably knock it out in a couple of months so um was so, it a double mask? <laughs> no, it was only a single mask. It probably oh, would have been. It would have been extremely complicated to make a double no. mask with with stone. It's not good enough, is it really? Well, I know how 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 thoughtless of it. Yeah, um, yeah I'm still seeing people in the middle of the countryside, by the way, wearing, wearing masks. masks. Oh yeah, I saw yeah. Them all the time. Um, yeah. On on the beach, wearing a mask, you know. Yeah, there was. Uh, a, I saw someone in a huge downpour the other day, where you know it was like you know when the heavens just open and it's just absolute sort of. Um, just totally pervasive rain. You you can barely sort of you know you can barely be outside for about a second without getting soaked. And I saw someone walking along with an umbrella. And you know there's, it's just there's not another human being for you can't even you just look around you can't even see another human being. And there, this person's wearing a mask. And you're thinking where you know it sort of seemed doubly kind of absurd with all this rain. You think well, where's where, it coming? Where I don't coming? understand. You know, how the, how is the COVID going to get you in this? Because you know, I mean you're outside in the middle of a rainstorm and there's no one here. So you know. I mean, our, 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 our public health overlords have specifically said you don't need to wear masks outside. You know, they, they've recommended against it. So I'm not quite sure where this will come from, you know. Um, well, it's, it's people, weird. People sort are, of virtue. Yeah, it's, people are scared, though, aren't they? I mean, I know there is an element of virtue signaling, but when I see people like that, I think they must be so terrified. Yeah. And they, they, just, they just think that this is going to help. So they think, well, why not? Or, you know, like when people are in their cars by themselves wearing masks. I mean it does it does make the mind boggle but i think it must just show that when people are really scared that they can't they just can't think straight you know they think mm -hmm. oh well i could die if i don't wear this mask even though i'm in a car or you know so um no i quite i i didn't mind the mask gargoyle i have to say i don't know what you chaps i don't know what you chaps whether you'd whether you'd go for it or not but i, I would, personally wouldn't have one in the house but um you know yeah. if, they, if, if they want to do it i'm never going to visit st Albans cathedral anyway so if they want to make one i'm why wouldn't you go to St Albans Cathedral, Tom? What's wrong? It's with just it? the wrong side of London, Jamie. I just—it's just a long way away. <laughs> I see. I see. I mean, I kind of—it's part of me that thinks nice work for the stonemason. Yeah. Um, everyone needs gainful employment, don't they? And uh, that's great. It's part of me that groans really at the whole. What, what is it trying to yeah. see or what's it about? You know. Yeah. Um, I, I, having had. Uh, Having seen locally some stonemason stuff, you know, it, it is a fine art which requires 
you know, considerable time payment. You know, it was for all the urgencies and supposedly financial straps that churches and cathedrals have. Was it really necessary? Yeah. Is it ever really necessary I'm not, I'm not, to? I think cases are about it. Yeah. Is it ever really necessary to construct a shrine in a in an Anglican church? There's another question well, there, isn't Tom, there? If I was if oh. I was to um, if I was to argue the toss here, I'd say it wasn't actually an Anglican church, was it? The Anglicans the Anglicans took it in the 16th century from from the the Western Church. But so I mean, to your I, listeners, this discussion will be available <laughs> as a separate, <laughs> as a separate i'm a paid up iconoclast anyway so you know no images uh, i don't want to talk i don't want to talk to you Tom. you're, you're so, you're so I, I did notice the filing cabinet behind you was looking a bit you know maybe needs an icon or something <laughs> yeah, with your with your, thing, your, your single palm cross against a filing cabinet yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. There's a bit of a makeover there, really. <laughs> yeah, well, no, okay, so chaps, I think we should go into our scripture section. So we've had a bit of a. The reason I wanted to just do a little bit of political stuff is because uh, we've got so much to talk about in the church uh this this week so i thought it'd be good to um to talk talk a, a little bit about that kind of uh, more sort of secular political stuff but um let's uh, just have a little reading from scripture here um i've been preparing a sermon on john uh chapter 17 so it's part of the high priestly prayer which is a prayer that jesus prayed um in the presence of the disciples and it, it comes in the gospel of john um, just prior to his going to the cross, you know, the climactic events of the gospel are about to happen. And um, just thinking through this passage, and um, I had a number of things going around in my head um, to do with some of the stuff that's come out from the Church of England this week. So one of the things that Christ says in this is he says, I do not pray, so speaking of the disciples, I do not pray that thou should take, take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be consecrated in the truth. And I don't know, I don't know if you chaps have ever heard this phrase. I suspect you have, um, in the world, but not of the world. But that was... Um, something I've heard a number of times uh, to sort of summarize the teaching of Christ or at least part of the teaching of the Christ in this passage is that he says to the father you know I don't want my disciples to be taken out of the world but I want you to protect them from the evil one or evil but probably the evil one meaning you know Satan and demonic forces um, they are not of the world meaning that they are you know they're not of the essence of the world they don't follow the world's standards they're not they shouldn't at least be interested in in the world's values and and so on and so forth uh, in the same way that i'm not of the world and so sanctify them in the truth thy word is truth i'm sending them into the world and so on and so forth um so i guess the the thing the reason i wanted to raise this is because certainly for me growing up and i think now when i read when I read scripture and when I meditate on verses like this, it does seem to me to be the case that as Christians, we're called not to be distinctive or, or rebellious or countercultural for the sake of it, but that we are to be holy, to be set apart for God and so on and so forth. And we should, we should be that way, regardless of what the culture around us is doing, that whether the culture likes us or dislikes us should be um, perhaps not an irrelevance but certainly a kind of at least a secondary consideration to what God wants from us and what God is calling us to do and um, so I would argue that for most Christians throughout history that means that the culture will be will be hostile to us at least in large part because um, because we're not interested in what the culture thinks, essentially. We should be interested in what God thinks and what God wants us to do. And our principles and the way that we, we live should flow from our understanding of the gospel, of scripture, the teaching of the church, and so on and so forth. And that um, this is why we sort of incur hostility from the world in the same way, obviously, that Jesus um, incurred hostility from the world, uh, because he, he cared about what God thought um, more than about what the world around him uh, thought and you know the, the world's values and, and so on and so forth um, 
so I just thought that was an interesting reflection, particularly in this week where we've been um, we've been subjected to. Well, I don't know whether we've actually been subjected to it yet, but this um, these recommendations on um, on uh, on monuments and statues in in the church in the churches has has come out um, from the central church, basically telling us that we need to uh, we need to remove uh, and assess offensive. Uh, articles of contested history um, so that the churches can now be uh, safe spaces and I think that this is a and this obviously flows from all the BLM stuff that was going on in the summer and everything and, and I think that this is an area where I feel I feel quite a lot of frustration because I feel that this this is indicative of an attitude that the Church of England higher-ups largely speaking have where they're, where they're, what they're doing is not flowing naturally from the gospel and from scripture and so on, but they are jumping on sort of fashionable political bandwagons and then trying to sort of um, retroactively refit them so that they match Christianity by saying, well, you know, this is the loving thing to do or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. What, 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 what do you think, chaps? I mean, do you, do you think I'm barking up the right tree there or... What, what are your thoughts? I think what makes it also complicated is that the, the woke agenda, as Tom Holland puts in his book Dominion, has very strong overtones of, uh, of Christianity and the gospel. Yeah. Um, but like a lot of heresies, it goes off mark. Yeah. And where it goes off mark uh, is... It is it's really on forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, on uh, on looking at the world in a low resolution way, where uh, the them and us uh, is is very stark, mm. black and white, um, and that clearly goes against the grain of the gospel, which has in itself. And most certainly, you know, in the mind of Christ, uh, a very nuanced, complex view of the human person and our psychology, you know, and our motives uh, and, and what have you. Um, I mean, that's the great thing about the Bible per se, is it, it feels very unedited. You know, if you read it, 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 it hasn't... The heroes uh, are, are often very fallen in it. Mm. Like the saints, the yeah. protagonists, um, like, like Simon Peter, um, for instance, or, or you know, a whole train of people in the Old Testament, you know, Moses, um, Abraham, David. Adam, so David, you know. Um, uh, these are people who kind of blunder on forward, and if it, by the grace of God, uh, they would never have got to where they got or achieved what they did, you know. Um, now, woke work ideology or worse still work theology can't process the world in that way and that that in one way makes it a very dangerous thing doesn't it to because you're sort of putting these kind of blanket condemnations on people um either through their past actions our, our ancestors uh or on you know racial groups mm. uh, at the moment you know so and we've seen that I mean, with white normativity, Eurocentrism, even even the ideas, the ideas that that science is you know, essentially prejudiced as a European project, yeah. and that logic and stuff like that. So it has it, it it has many of the elements of for me of the the early church heresies that were around. Yeah. You know, it kind of looks good. But actually, close examination is off the mark. Yeah. And that, the further you go down that, the more off the mark it goes. Yeah. Uh, and you end up, like with the road to perdition, you end up actually creating something, as with most utopian projects, that's, that, that is um, uh, the road to hell. It's, it's a disaster. Disaster movie in the making. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, um, 
the you, you put you put your finger on the mark here, Daniel. It reminds me of the quotation from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, where he says that um, the line between good and evil is not between separate groups of people, but it runs down every single human heart. And um, you've 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 been kind enough to show us. Um, you've been show, you've been kind enough to show us a preview of an article which you've got in the Spectator coming out. Um, I think it's in this week's uh, edition, where you um, you make this point. Yeah, so special special yeah. times. Daniel is in, printed in the in the Spectator this week. Print, yeah. Um, that's page, page eighteen. Page eighteen. Yeah, it's going to be there. But um, this is this is this is really good. Uh, par can I read this paragraph? Is that okay? I'm not. I'm not going to be. Um, so so you're right. Well, it'll go out on Friday. And it's coming out tomorrow. So it's fine. Yeah, fantastic. It's particularly galling that the guidance appears to run directly counter to Christianity's core message of forgiveness. It is possible that in my parish there are monuments to dodgy dukes, nasty nobles, and pilfering privateers. Very good. Who creamed off profits from slavery and colonial excesses. Now, a cursory investigation might put them in the bad books, but how do I know whether or not they made reparation, even last minute confession? Who am I to judge what happened centuries back, let alone what might have occurred in the secrets of people's hearts? Who is anyone to judge? Um, and then in the next paragraph, you say, um, where will such identity politics lead us? Who is to say that the list of undesirables will be confined to historical figures involved in colonialism and the slave trade? Might it end up being expanded to include those who judged of personalities, sorry, those judged of personality flaws and moral failings and so on. But that, that makes the point, doesn't it? Is that uh, it, it reminds me of the Psalm where it says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? Is that when you actually start to think about it, we're all sinful and we've all done things which are wrong and we've all failed. We've all said things which are wrong and done things which are wrong. And so ultimately none of us, none of us deserve anything. You know, we deserve to be judged by God um, for our sin. But it's in Christ that we're we're redeemed. You know, we're redeemed by grace. And it seemed to be it seems to me to be a, a very um, graceless way of thinking about other people. Especially if you say they're dead, they can't speak for themselves. You know, they're dead. They've got no way of representing themselves. Yeah. Quite apart from anything else, it's, it's absolutely impossible to take um, today's moral system and apply it to people who weren't under that and judge them by it i mean is that there's no there's no sense in which that could ever be a fair thing to do um but the, the other the other big issue is to kind of where do you stop i mean i was thinking about bristol cathedral which i think you know has that has that um it windowed which is dedicated uh well to the memory of Col um, colston uh and obviously he was involved in uh, slave trade and um he was one whose sl uh, statue was thrown into the um into the water um now as it happens, the entire, let me get this right, it's the entire west end of the cathedral uh, from the transepts going all the way back to the Twin Towers. All of that was built in the 1860s. And all of it would have been built by people who, at the very least, um, their fathers, but possibly even they, uh, would have had significant assets in slaves, uh, in tobacco, uh, in, in cotton. Um, should we just demolish it all? I mean, surely if you can if you can take out a window, which is what they're going to do, you should you should just knock down the whole cathedral. You know, in fact, there's a there's a Norman chapter house. I mean, the Normans, as we all well know, came in and subjugated a free Saxon population to the effective chattel slavery of feudalism, uh, which which took away their rights to the land um, uh, and made it made them sort of, uh, sort of effectively slaves. They 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 didn't own the land they worked. They weren't given wages. They were allowed to keep some of the produce they produced. Um, you know, should we then destroy all Norman churches? I mean, surely we should, ar arguably. Uh, how far back do you go? How, how can you do any of this? I mean, and if you're not going to do all of that, then, then can you do anything? I, I wish I could get the document up, the guidelines that came out on Tuesday, because having a quick scan of, of it, and it's a very sort of glossy, presentable piece. Yeah. But it, it's, I mean, it's not as bad as the one a couple of weeks ago in terms of um, woke buzz terms and stuff. However, there's a chilling sentence. I, I might have done a screen copy of it actually, uh, which says this is a um, uh, no, I, ha I haven't got it. Um, but basically, it, it says this is a methodology for looking at other uh, misdemeanors. Right. Um, so. I kind of guessed that in my article because 
we couldn't get hold of a copy from uh, the Church of England on Monday when it, when the documents came out on Tuesday. And hauntingly, I was spot on. Yeah. Oh, tragically, that yes, this is a lens by which you could look at a whole load of other stuff. You know, so the question I put then is, well, you know, there are certain people in history that I personally, you know, don't like. I, I'm no fan of Henry VIII, and there's a rather nice Henry VIII stained glass, rather striking stained glass window of him in yeah. Chapman House in Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, now here's a misogynist tyrant. Why is he up there? Yeah. You know, why is someone who, who's worse than a wife beater? Yeah. Well, he, he executed his wife. So. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, you know, a sociopath. And yet we've got a stained glass window of him. Yeah. Uh, only because say the same for Oliver Cromwell. Uh, you know, uh, however, I think Cromwell's enjoyed being tossed in the river and pulled back and tossed enough times. But, um, but you know, I mean, where, where do you go with that? You know, St. Paul. Slaves, you know, that they, well, what's his favorite? It's two quotes, isn't it? Cliff, Ephesians. Slaves, slaves obey your masters. It's in, it's in Ephesians chapter uh, five and Colossians. Yeah, there's one in Colossians as well, I think, as well. Um, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis was accused of, um, in the Narnia Chronicles, of misogyny and uh, racist innuendo in some of the portrayals uh, of characters. Now, you know, do is is it Headington? Is is his grave safe? Yeah. You know, where where do you where do we stop with this? Um, if this is going to be the lens by which we look at all the things that we have inherited from others, yeah, um, it's crazy. It, yeah. Shakespeare, Shakespeare, obviously, you know, it, it, he was. No, Gladstone's already gone, isn't he? He's, we can't, we can't have anything Shakespeare left. I mean, it has um, to all be salted because yeah. he was obviously a misogynist and he was obviously also a um, anti-semite now, because darwin, every... darwin i've heard as well you know p45 for him yeah uh, so, so can i just ask you a real really practical question here so i guess my my i'm the first question i i want to ask is does the central church actually have any authority to make anyone do this stuff right so that's my first question well i i suspect the answer is no um because my understanding is that the archbishop of canterbury is a kind of you know, he's he's a kind of um, prima inter pars. You know, first among equals. He's not the he's not the monarchical head of the Church of England like the Pope is the is the monarchical head of the of the Church of Rome. So I don't really know what authority he has to be forcing everyone to do this. So that's the first thing. And then the second, and so I I, I don't know. Am I am I basically right about that? Uh, I want I think, to say something else, but am I, I right? think you can have. I think you can have soft power and hard power. You might not have the ability to force it, but you can't imagine any bishops going against it. And if then you have a vicar who sort of says, "I don't want to do this. I'm not going to do this," and doesn't do it, well, are they going to get a post uh, when when they come to? Um, well, I can, I, I can very I can very well imagine a bishop not not going with it. I mean, the 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 whole notion that the Archbishop of Canterbury can order bishops around is just. It's just nonsense. I mean, but it is, but they've not. We've not got those independent, um, you know, free-thinking bishops anymore. They've all retired. Um, you know, you know, it's interesting to me. Um, I read a, a really good book called um, "Orthodox Anglican Identities" by Charles Erlinson, and so he's an American. So he's part of the uh, Continuing Anglican Church, right? So the American Church of North America, he's part of, which are uh, an Anglican church that's split off from uh, the, the Episcopal Church, which is the uh, Anglican Church in America. Uh, because because they're they're heretics basically, and um, it's interesting when you read this book that there are lots and lots of global Anglicans, millions of global Anglicans who just view Canterbury indifferently. They're like, well, yeah, of course Can- they do. Canterbury is Canterbury is like the some ceremonial um, the ceremonial seat of the Church of England, and it's got in historic importance, but it's got it's got no sort of monarchical or legislative importance for for millions of Anglicans worldwide. The Americans don't think it, of themselves. It does well. have. I think I'm right in saying it does have, does it not have the power to decide which provinces are in communion or not? Well, you can, with you, itself, you, but with itself. With itself. These, the but, Acna, Acna doesn't yeah. care whether, you know, they don't care whether they're in communion with, with Canterbury. They consider Canterbury to be a liberal church. Mm-hmm. I mean, Erlinson literally lists the liberal churches in, in global Anglicanism. 
and he includes the Church of England in that. So they don't care. It's, it, to them, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a central constituent of their identity as Anglicans that they are in I, I believe that, with Canterbury. Yeah. yeah. There was I believe for that a while, yeah. wasn't it? There was for a while this thing so, that, that to be Anglican was to be in communion. That, that was being posed, wasn't it, from this side? That's well, what, it's that's a, what that's Anglicans that's be. Yeah. Union with, with the Archbishop of Canterbury. That's what the Archbishop of Canterbury maintains. That's what the Church of England maintains. That in theory, Anglicanism is to be a member of uh, the Anglican Consultative Council, I think, and to be in communion with uh, with with the Archbishop of Can Canterbury, and, the, and maybe also to be invited along to the um, Lambeth Conference. I think all of those things play parts in 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 this sort of a, official declaration of, of being Anglican. But then you have the ANCA who 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 effectively they're, they're in communion with large chunks of the Anglican communion uh, by bilateral agreements. I mean, I believe they're certainly in, in communion with a lot of the African churches. Um, so they don't really care that they, they, they're not in communion with, with Canterbury. They're, they're in communion with probably the majority of the but Anglican wouldn't it, church. Wouldn't it be interesting as a sort of game changer in this? I'm not surprised. I know there have been calls for this, but there's never been any kind of great momentum at the moment on this, that if the, uh, the presidency of the Anglican Consultative Communion, which is the Archbishop. Yeah. Um, why is that not uh, an elected post amongst the bishops, the primates of the Church of, of, of the Anglican Communion worldwide? You know, why does it always rest? But because, I mean, that's just Western imperialism, isn't it? It's basically well, that's racism. Exactly it. um, <laughs> that's exactly it, isn't it? That, it's, that we it's, don't trust the rest of the Communion with this to be honest they're I, a bit to, i mean I, I would they would give it they would put it canterbury it, would put it up for, if it was a free vote it wouldn't be in canterbury it would be in nigeria or in um you mm. know one of the one of the great uh, orthodox anglican churches of, of africa um, well you have the irony with as you have with gafcon you have the irony of say Foley beach yeah, being yeah. the president of the anglican communion but not in communion Lady, with uh, not in communion yeah. with about five percent yeah, so, so just to explain yeah, that. For, um, yeah, there's a lot yeah, of jargon there. We should probably explain that a little bit. So GAFCON is uh, the Global Anglican Futures Good. Conference, which is a, which is a, a sort of um, affiliation of Orthodox Anglicans, I suppose, who are broadly speaking concerned about the liberal direction of, of the, uh, I, I guess, the Church of England and the, the churches which are uh, in communion with, with the Church of England, such as the Episcopal Church in the US. And the, um, the Anglicans in Africa tend to be Orthodox Christians, and they can't they can't understand the the liberalising direction that the Church of England is is going in, and um, yeah, I mean this this kind of thing doesn't doesn't help matters, do, does it? I mean, so so I've just I have actually found this this document right. So one of the points you made in the article, Daniel, is, is a very good point, which is that we have a we have a mission as ministers of the gospel and more broadly speaking as, as Christians, which is, be, which is to be, uh, you know, to be salt and light. I mean, specifically as, as ministers, I suppose we are, we are ministers of word and sacrament, we're to preach the truth, we're, we're to disciple people, we're to preach the gospel and see people come to faith, we're to administer the sacraments of baptism, the Eucharist and so on. Um, but what this, what this is proposing for us is basically to become, uh, you know, to, to go round our churches um, so here, here we've got here we've got a um, a little quotation here. So they they uh, recommend a robust process of research, consultation, and reflection. So you've got to go around all your monuments and statues and, and little plaques in your churches, and you've got to subject them to a robust process of research, con consultation, and reflection. And after you've done that, the decision may be made that no change is needed to an object its context or location or how you interpret it for visitors. No change is not the same as no action. If concerns have been raised, they're not taking any action of any kind, even by way of research or consultation, could be viewed as unwillingness to address or even acknowledge the issue and as going against Christian teachings on racism. If you decide on no change, it will therefore be important to document and record your decision-making process and to communicate your reasons clearly so that the outcome is not misinterpreted as inertia. My question would be, misinterpreted by who? Who cares? Literally, who cares? Who's going to be asking you? Look, Daniel French, where, where is your rationale for not taking down these statues from the 19th century? 
where is your where is your thorough documentation your reasoning process because i really need to see it otherwise i'm going to interpret your non-action as inertia i mean it's absolutely ridiculous oh, and how much do you know what's worse? What really riles me about this is here we are running a podcast. Yeah. Where we're getting thousands of downloads. Thank you, listeners. Yes, indeed. Yeah. We're connecting on Patreon, on YouTube, um, emails. I'm getting dozens of emails every every other day from people wanting, you know, spiritual questions, wanting uh, you know, answers or direction one in conversation, we're actually talking to a whole constituency of people interested in Christianity, um, who are saying things like, as we know, you know, maybe, I, maybe my atheism isn't so on such found, good foundations and I should go, you know, I'd like to go forward with you on this. I'd like to explore more about what you actually believe. So we've got this a tremendous work. Uh, and what are we to do? Are we just, should we just put that aside? Because I'm terribly sorry, folks. We've got to make an audit of every grave <laughs> monument. Let's, let's just forget this stuff because we've got to work out in the 18th, 17, whatever. You know, it, it's crazy. It's at, where, does, where do they want our energies to be? Yeah. At the front line, at a time of pandemic, when everybody is been pushed down we're going to we're going to take the luxury of doing an audit on all our artifacts art and architecture and we've got to do it robustly so you know that's that's not an afternoon that's this is this is, this is you know, documented a yeah. serious serious project it's much yeah. asking people to do and, and, um, and you know, how many churches do you have daniel four four so you've got to do it in each church as well you know yeah. Uh, yeah. talking about thousands of monuments overall yeah, exactly where do you want me to be do you want me to be talking to people who are actually asking i want to know more about jesus christ or do you want me to be going around with a clipboard looking at graves and statues and monuments unfortunately uh, Lord unfortunately knows, you know, the, i mean it's absolutely it's indulgent it's crazy it, it's um, complete madness Unfortunately, the church's hierarchy, are, they, they talk the noise about wanting to um, evangelize and, and grow churches, um, not least because they're terrified for their own pensions, one suspects. But they're, they're, they're also at the same time tying clergy down ever more uh, in, in tape, in, in red tape. Um, and it's not what we train for. It's weird, really weird. You, the discernment process, as far as I can tell, is find people who, ha, who are called by the Holy Spirit to minister to God's people, who have gifts of communication, who have gifts of um, leadership, and, uh, and take those people and turn them into bureaucrats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, well, I mean, so, I it's a waste I of everyone's time. Characterize the uh, the discernment process quite in such a in such a, a, a positive way as as you. Well, that's the idea, isn't it? Uh, but, well, yeah. I mean, it's, well, they say it's, it's becoming less and less something even people even bother articulating now. Uh, it reminds me of a friend years ago up in Scotland who got a parish where he had, as part of his rectory, several acres of land, yeah. and he went to the parish council and said, "Well, you know, clearly." Because in Scotland, the parishes pay the priest directly. So it's, it's either said you've got a direction. You've got two things you could do. You could have a gardener, or you can have a parish priest. If you want the parish priest, sell the land. If you want the gardener, find someone else. It's easy decision. You know, where do you want my energies to be? Yep. And, you know, they... they rightly pick the option to have a parish priest you know that's where that's where the energy has to be that's what we're called to do yeah this is this is quite literally they are literally asking for a monumental waste of time here that's what this is this is a literal monumental waste of time and i'm sorry if i'm sorry if people have used that um that uh, pattern before but it's 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 ultimately and I, I i'm sorry to keep on going on about this because people are going to think i'm some kind of some kind of um 
some kind of nutcase, but it's ultimately a spiritual matter. <laughs> they do it already. But, you know, they obviously do, they obviously do already. But this is a spiritual matter, isn't it? This is what the enemy wants. He wants yep. to distract us from what we should be doing with things which are completely irrelevant. And this is a this is an absolutely enormous it's a belter. waste of time and energy and focus. And as such, we're not going to talk about it anymore. I've had enough of it. Let's move on to another uh, equally positive. <laughs> Let's <story. play laughs> So this one, this is this is. Uh, Have you got the documentation story. behind moving on? Are you sure this isn't inertia? Yeah, this, yeah. checking. No, this is this is um, this is unbelievable. Well, I mean, it's not unbelievable, but this is um, this is a story which a number of people sent this to me, and it, this has been widely shared. Um, so I've got a good article summarising this story to do with uh, Reverend Doctor Bernard Randall, who is a priest in the Church of England, former chaplain of Christ uh, College, uh, Cambridge. And he is taking Trent College, which is near here, I'm happy to say, to court for discrimination, harassment, victimization and unfair dismissal. So in 2018, uh, the independent school Trent College, uh, which has a Protestant and Evangelical Church of England ethos, invited the leader of Educate and Celebrate Dr. Ellie Barnes into the school to train staff. Uh, educate and Celebrate claims to equip you and your communities with the knowledge, skills and confidence to embed gender, gender identity and sexual orientation into the fabric of your organisation. Dr Barnes openly declares that the ethos of Educate and Celebrate is to, quotation, completely smash heteronormativity. That's what we want to do. Heteronormativity being the belief that a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman is what is normal. Uh, Dr Randall was alarmed during the training when Dr. Barnes instructed staff to chant the words, smash heteronormativity. I mean, I can imagine someone saying, you know, you've got to do this, but it's, that, that's quite a mouthful to chant, I think. It's not very catchy. Anyway, uh, Dr. I Barnes- I was wondering, does, does it go, was that, do you remember the tune to um, Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> smash then, heteronormativity. Yeah, yeah, Seven, seven Nation Army. Seven by, that's it, yeah. The yeah. Um, it doesn't quite, does it? Yeah, so, so skipping on a bit. So he raised, Dr. Randall raised concerns. Um, and then he asked, he did, he was canvassing students to see what subjects they'd like in a sermon, right? So somebody approached him, a student with, had written this down. How come we are told we have to accept all this LGBT stuff in a Christian school? And apparently a number of other students asked him uh, about this as well. So he wrote and delivered a sermon called Competing Ideologies, which, which I can put on the show notes. This is a very good sermon. I, I read it. Um, and they, uh, this uh, Christian concern, which I'm reading this from, describes this as a moderately and carefully presented uh, Christian viewpoint on identity questions, encourage, encouraging debate and stressing that no protected characteristic is more protected than any other. Um, he explained that for Christians, it's vital to love your neighbour, leaving no room for personal attack or abusive language towards anyone. And if you read the sermon, you'll see he says this over and over again. I mean, you could even say it's almost the basic message of the sermon is that although people might disagree, about these these sensitive issues, nevertheless, we should love and respect each other, and that's something which is central to a to a Christian ethos and and a tolerant society. It's so it could not be clearer. So it's a great um, sermon. It's really good. I'd, I'd encourage people to listen to yeah, it, uh, read it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's really really good. Um, it's, it's and mild man, you know, it's, it's, it's very mild man. It's gentle. Anglicanism at its best, isn't it? It's mild yeah. mannered, yeah. profound, it's good, um, intelligent, intelligent, uh, insightful. You know, yeah. So uh, he, uh, it's, uh, it's traditionalist potential, you know, I, I, presumably he's, he's arguing from a traditional point of view, but it's so gracious. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and, and one of the essential things is that he was encouraging students to debate the issue and to make up their own minds about what they yeah. thought. He was saying, essentially, he was saying that whole thing. It's not about it's, education isn't about being told what to think. It's about being told how to think or, or taught how to think. Which, uh, um, <sighs> is probably a better way of putting it. So he's saying, you've got, to, you've got to make up your own minds. And if you're Christians, you know, you need to think about scripture and you know, what, what yeah. God has revealed about this and so on and so forth. Anyway, so it's a really good sermon. Um, so the following week, he was pulled into a meeting with the deputy head and the school's designated safeguard lead. There was a hostile interrogation in which Dr. Randall was told that his beliefs were not relevant and did not matter and that the sermon had hurt some people's feelings. It's a very, very strange thing to, to do to tell someone who's literally there to be a Christian presence in a, at least in theory, Christian school. He's, he's there, I mean, his job description is to be the particular voice and embodiment of Christian values. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so then to be told that those don't actually matter is, yeah. is, 
you're going to like this next bit, Tom. This is a bit which made me think of you. So he told it undermined the school's LGBT agenda. And then he was asked what the sources of the church's teaching were. And so he said, for the beliefs on marriage, sexuality and gender, he pointed to the Church of England's public liturgy, especially the Book of Common Prayer and, and Canon Law. So uh, good that's, reasonable. That, that's a good answer, isn't it? And then he was suspended um, and reported to a terrorist watchdog uh, without his knowledge, the uh, government's counterterrorism watchdog, uh, pre prevent as a potentially violent religious extremist. Uh, he was also reported to, this was their safeguarding uh, lead officer. It's cucumber well, sandwiches at dawn, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Reported him to a local authority designated officer as a danger to children, which is the same point of contact for reporting concerns over paedophilia. On the 1st of July 2019, a Derbyshire police officer, Richard Barker, responded to the report to prevent, saying the sermon posed no counter-terrorism risk view. Uh, however, documents revealed that, according to the DSL, he gave his personal opinion that the sermon was, quotation, wholly inappropriate for, for a school and society in general. I mean, that's really shocking, isn't it? That's I mean, for, really, for, for, it's really not the police's, it's yeah. not in any way the police's position to tell us what and what isn't appropriate. Uh, we talked about this was it last week or was it two weeks we, you know the police have no place in deciding what is and isn't appropriate unless someone is causing uh you know um uh, is, is exhorting violence uh of any of any sort then then there is no place for the police in uh in communication you know yeah i mean how is it inappropriate for society to say people disagree about this issue and they should treat each other with respect i mean isn't that sort of the meant to be the epitome of a kind of liberal and tolerant and open society it's absolutely ridiculous anyway it gets it gets even more kafkaesque and absurd so dr randall was provided with 20 conditions that he had to comply with regarding any future sermons it sounds like being a curate doesn't it tom uh, it's just a joke it's just a joke my curacy is not like that at all open no, no, censorship no, 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 no. Open censorship of his sermons followed. Within the 20 conditions he had to comply with, he was banned from broaching, quotation, any topic or express any opinion in chapel or more generally around school that is likely to cause offence or distress to members of the school body. I mean, how what, is what about, um, you know, the message of the cross any, is offensive, you yeah, know, to, <laughs> reading something like from, from Revelation? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, so it also stated that you will not publicly express personal beliefs in ways which exploit our pupils' vulnerability. He was told that every theme and piece of sermon content had to be approved by school leadership in advance and that a staff member would observe to ensure each stipulation was met. Um, then the country went into lockdown in March 2020. He was furloughed. As restrictions eased, the school refused to reinstate his timetable, planning to reduce his full-time hours to seven hours per week. And he was eventually made redundant in uh, on the 31st of September 2020. December, yeah. Uh, sorry, 31st of December 2020, yeah. So, and then this is a quotation from him. Uh, I was ter terrified. Oh, this is about the prevent being pre uh, reported to prevent. I was to, I was terrified. I did not sleep. What was I supposed to tell my family? Being reported as a potential terrorist, extremist, and a danger to children. These are arguably the worst crimes you could be accused of. When I found out that they had reported me without telling me, my mind was blown trying to comprehend it. I had gone to such lengths in the sermon to stress that we must respect one another no matter what, even people we disagree with. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried with relief when I was told that the report to prevent was not going to be taken further. Yet I ended up being told that I had to support everybody else's belief no matter what, while my Christian beliefs, the Church of England's beliefs, were blatantly censored. During the disciplinary hearing, I was never asked what I thought. They just assumed that I had extreme religious views. I don't think the Church of England is an extremist organisation. I was doing the job I was employed to do. I wasn't saying anything that I should not have been able to say in any liberal secular institution. Everyone should be free to accept or reject an ideology. Isn't that what liberal democracy means? My story sends a message to other Christians that you're not free to talk about your faith. It seems it is no longer enough to just tolerate LGBT ideology. You must accept it without question, and no debate is allowed without serious consequences. Someone else will decide what is and what isn't acceptable, and suddenly you can become an outcast, possibly for the rest of your life. I 100% see what has happened to me in Orwellian terms. Truth matters, but increasingly powerful groups in our society do not care about the truth. My career and life are in tatters. I believe that if this is the cross that I have to carry to help others prevent, sorry, to, that I have to carry to help prevent others from experiencing the same as me, I have no choice but to pursue justice. He's a brave man. And, you know, um, 
here we have a church that's spending its time worrying about offensive monuments when someone who's preaching the message of the cross and of reconciliation of forgiveness and of christianity is is as far as i can tell being ignored by the hierarchy um, this this is the real grave matter you pardon the pardon. um <laughs> and, and this, this is, the question that comes to mind when it comes to uh this fantastic clergyman is um the first thought i had when i read read his sermon is I wonder if there are any vacancies around, because yeah. uh, this man should be elevated. Yes. You know, this is this is who this is the sort of people we should be promoting. Church. Church Sorry, I just started a video by mistake. It's something I was looking at. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, no, you're you're quite right. I mean, it's it's interesting, isn't it? He's got some he's got some interesting. Um, quotations here. I mean, one of the things he says about the Church of England is that it is a, um, I can't quite find it, but I think he said something like it's uh, an as it's, it's promoting an ersatz religion with burning heretics, uh, which is, which is quite true. But I, I think one of the, one of the important things that he brings up is this issue of, of, of um, what is essentially kind of, um, I suppose, a sort of postmodernism, isn't it? Where he's saying that really it's not important what what is true, but it's about, you know, it's about powerful groups in our society who are each sort of competing with each other and that they don't, they don't care about the truth. If, if, they, uh, if they don't like what you think, they'll just squash you and, uh, and ruin your life. And, um, and so this whole ideal, which, I mean, does anyone in our society actually still believe that we are a tolerant and liberal and open society where we actually debate things because we think that through debate we're going to come to some kind of higher understanding of what it is that we're talking about and that's that's just not the way that dialogue is carried out now increasingly so disagreement is seen as as purely hostile you know so if you disagree with me you hate me you're a threat to me and therefore i'm going to crush you because you because you have because you disagree with me and so we're we're we're, we're now as a society increasingly in this agonistic mindset where these powerful groups are competing with one another and trying to squash each other and destroy each other. And again, this, this totally ties in with the, um, with the racism thing, because that's exactly the same, that's exactly the same thing that's going on there as well. You know, we've had the way they, the way that it's put is that, well, there was this powerful group, you know, white men, white heterosexual men, and now we've got other powerful groups that are, that are in the ascendancy and we're going to squash this group. And this group has to be, you know, this group has to be marginalized and it has to suffer and it has to atone while the other groups, you know, are, are in the ascendancy. And there's no, there's no sense in any of this that there is any forgiveness, that there's any grace and that there's any room for, for respectful dialogue. And that's the thing, which is one of the, especially in a school, it's one of the worst things about this is that these children, what's being modeled for these children in, in that school, you know, in terms of, in terms of debate, in terms of learning to live with difference and so on and so forth. It's, it's an appalling example to set for children. Yeah, it's a civilization, isn't it? He who shouts loudest wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, that's a highway to hell. Yeah. And if, if we're, if we are making our schools into factories that produce that kind of moronic individual yep. who is going to be, who, who needs to negotiate safe space from safe space as soon as they leave the front door. Yeah. You know, how, how ironic as well that he's the one who's being investigated for potentially causing violence. Mm. I mean, it's, it, the, 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 the ideology that's being promoted here is, is far more likely to cause violence than his sort of mild-mannered... Um, liberalism. Yeah, his mild-mannered li liberalism in, in a good sense. Yeah, the proper, uh, not, proper not, liberalism. Not, not like in a heretical sense, but, you know, saying... I mean, you can, you can obviously tell reading the sermon what he thinks, right? You can, you can clearly tell what he thinks. Uh, but, he's, but he's trying to say that this is this is a, you know this is a conversation which is okay right. it's okay to have at some know? point he says that you don't even have to take what i'm saying as as you know yeah. as a as a, a you know a fact it's not, no one <laughs> no one has any need to automatically assume uh sort of 
things um everyone should question everything they hear that's reasonable that's you know uh, that's basically what he says you know i think this but you don't have to you've been told this but you don't have to think that either make your own mind up you know yeah but, yeah but this, this, that's that's an adult way of looking at things and we've moved away from uh, from from an adult way of discussing in this country you know we're, we're, we're stuck uh, our, uh paul paul would have called us you know we're stuck drinking milk now as a country we're not we're not on adult food anymore we can't we can't the, the, the foundations of proper understanding have, have gone and yeah. the foundations of proper understanding i think rowan williams makes this point in lost icons the book you know how childhood is so important because in childhood you're allowed to experiment and hold ideas without them being considered um you know uh wrong well it's, it's uh, yeah without, let, let without believe them taken seriously without them being taken seriously yeah, without... so, so my my son sometimes put nail varnish on his fingers right he's three years old okay yeah. now that's that's an experiment it doesn't mean he he's a woman trapped inside no. a, a um, man's body you know and it's it's childhood and play have been taken away from children um, yeah. they, they now have to sign up to fundamental tenets of the postmodernistic world and, and they have to hold it and the whole gamut of peer pressure is, is put against them you, you might wonder whether there are some governmental nudge scientists working in there it wouldn't surprise me uh jamie i've been spending too much time with you i'm becoming a, a theorist um and um <laughs> You're but, becoming, you're, you're becoming awake, Tom. Your eyes are slowly opening. I just, I just, um, I just wonder whether there's a problem here. In well, there is a problem with education, and we see it because this is obviously a place of education where, where being told that classical idea of, you know, uh, you know, you need to go out, you need to work out what you think, you need to take um, all the evidence and weigh it up in yourself, and no one else can do that for you. Uh, has been replaced with um with indoctrination yeah but do you remember um, a couple of years ago school in the secondary school in scotland um it's there on youtube uh where the i think it was a six warmer questioned uh a gender identity if i remember rightly and he was taken out of class and given a lecture threatened with you know a, a real telling of or what have you it was a very intimidating incident yeah. where the, the teacher came in and basically told him you've got to believe this and he said but sir i don't yeah and the, the pupil recorded it <laughs> yeah uh, you, i mean it's scary isn't it you've got to believe what so is it was you've got to believe that a woman can be can become a man and you know that that kind of stuff i mean it's yeah i mean it's it's a post it's a post truth world we're living in isn't it i mean it's it's uh, that's the way things are going and um, I, I, ironically I've, i was reading in lockdown skeptics there's a rather good article about um, a, a university um let me get it right um the uh, uh where is it um hang on here we are um it's gone missing Basically, a university in America has done a, did a, did a, had a look at um, skeptics, and they discovered that quite 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 far from their initial assumptions, uh, skeptics weren't fact denying. They weren't um, uh, they, they weren't any less able to. In fact, they presented their their findings with far more uh, the far more charts um, than uh, than the, the than the non skeptical position. You know, who tended to use sort of emotive photos and things like that, whereas skeptics tended to present their findings in charts. They tended to be quite uh, numerate uh, they tended to value numeracy and value the, uh, what the, the big difference between them they, they identified was that skeptics had a sort of quite a liberal uh, sort of um, uh, sense of what science should be in as much as science should be ground up sort of um, you know science should be science rather than the science yeah, uh, rather and, than ideology uh, not an ideology and and they sort of admit that there's no such thing as as truth in science in there that that, that science is a is a that these 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 people who went out there to find these sort of uh, Neanderthal knuckle dragging conspiracy theorist uh, skeptics have actually found a group of people who are simply interested and able to make their own mind up and not prepared to have it made up for them. Yeah. Um, and this is this is interesting because it shows you something of, of the mindset of of those people who are now trying to control society that they don't trust us anymore. They they no longer. Uh, look at us as adults able to to weigh our own risks up but rather as 
cattle to be to be herded to be locked into your pens overnight uh when required uh you know um, during the day as well tom well yeah yeah obviously um, all the time to be locked up during, all, all the time. whenever the time. whenever they fancy it really whenever they think it's a good idea i and, mean to, uh, to, to, sorry to interrupt tom but just to say i mean the skeptics that i know are all i would say i can't think of a single one who i wouldn't say is a highly intelligent person and i'm not i'm not saying that in order to sort of you know to, to glorify myself or anything um and my sort of circle my sort of circle of contacts but honestly i mean highly highly intelligent people often people who are scientists doctors uh people with people with doctorates um you know been to top universities i mean you know these are not these are not thick people we're talking about here you know and yeah. i know we've talked about that a lot but people, i found the, you know, found like, the article it's, it's called MIT researchers find that skeptics value data, literacy and scientific rigor. And, and the quote is this, while academic science is traditionally a system for producing knowledge within a laboratory, validating it through peer review and sharing results within subsidiary communities, i.e. quite a statist centralized persist, uh, system. Uh, Anti-maskers reject this hierarchical social model. They espouse a vision of science that is radically egalitarian and individualist. And I mean, you know, I, I like that. I think that's. I think that's true. I think that people, generally, people uh, who would think that, because that's how science has made most of the major discoveries over the years. It's, it's not been. Uh, it's not been big, state-funded laboratories and centralized positions. It's been individuals having a good idea. Yeah, you know, on the woke, um, some social science equivalent of that. I think the danger is, particularly in the social sciences, that they try to create. A, a kind of hard left year zero you know, where nothing before a certain date can have any kind of validity. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick incidence of this was a few years back I was at a, a seminar, a sort of precursor to a kind of un unconscious bias um, training thing, but it was, a, it was done in a theological setting. Um, and the um, facilitator was telling us, you know, how many forms of sexual orientation there are, and how many gender identities there are, and so on and so on. Uh, and all the various sort of flags and things that go with that. Uh, and the question was put to her about Thomas Aquinas's sense <laughs> of, Thomas Aquinas's anthropology, you know, this sense that the soul is female, you know, in, in the presence of God, that we are, we are the one who receives from God, and that's our, our kind of participation, hence the Song of Songs. Um, and it was hilarious, because it was as if gobbledygook had just yeah. been spoken, because clearly the facilitator was living in year zero, where all that stuff in the past has no use, no function in her intellectual life. I thought that um, Thomas Aquinas said that the soul is neither male nor female. And his, his, um, his yeah. reasoning for this was that in the incarnation, Christ needed to represent all of humanity. And that so which is not soul, assumed is not saved. Yeah. yeah. I, I may have got it wrong, but do you know what I mean? I'm going to go yeah, no, I know, I know exactly what you mean. You know where I'm going with this. There's, I there's I a I medieval think about, anthropology. Yeah, but this, that's, that's quite a good point, isn't it? That yeah. On the Christian worldview, if, if Christ's soul was neither male nor female, and that is representative of humanity. That means that this whole idea that like there's some kind of inside, you know, some kind of some kind of essence which is inside of us, which is gendered, is is anti Christian. It's antithetical, it's antithetical to Christianity. It's such a load of, it's such a load of nonsense. I mean, I to, you know, I... we have a physical body, we have a biological body which clearly is gendered, or is or is as, is of a particular sex. It's a scientific fact, and then and then we're supposed to not believe that. But we're supposed to believe that we have some, we have like some kind of interior ethereal essence, like a soul, which is gendered. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is just nonsense. I mean, but I mean the heterodoxy of it, can't you? Again, is, I had to, is a bit a slight variation. That the more you go down, the wider it takes you away. From I, had, I had an argument with uh, the priest called Tina Beardsley about this. Oh um, yes, on a, uh, on, on, um, on a website uh, run by. Um, like a virtue online I think it was is that the liberal sort of news and blog and uh, she basically just said oh well we don't believe that sort of uh, you know old-fashioned way of looking at um, 
year zero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, uh, no, that's, that was how she dealt with that. Because as a, you know, as you quite rightly point out, you know, where are we locating the sense of uh, of gender identity that is separate from sex yeah. is separate from our soul but if our souls um, the other the other thing they do is go ahead and say that uh, jesus christ was trans um is, is is quite a common theme in uh in queer theology as i understand uh which um brings its own problems uh, not least that it's completely made up um and <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an issue i mean trans <laughs> I'm saying that I'm saying that you can say what you like uh, about Jesus, but I will quite happily stick with what it says in the Bible, and it I doesn't say that. Any, I've checked. Uh, the Gospel of There's an American Lutheran trans bishop who has stated that the, we need the church needs to uh, distangle itself from the Fourth Ecumenical Council from Nicaea because Nicaea is a this is a Dan Brown thing, I think, that came up, comes up in the Da Vinci Code, that allegedly the, the full council um, you know, it imposed upon it a sort of anti-trans doctrine. Yeah. Right. Well, there we Disentangle there we, ourselves from the cornerstone of Christian the, uh, of, of orthodoxy. That sounds like a really good idea. What I, that what will I go think we, well. need to, <laughs> we, we need to disentangle ourselves from the heretical elements of the Anglican Church. That's what we need to disentangle ourselves from. Um, chaps, I need to go in about 15 minutes or so. So I think we're going to have to just move on to the email of the week, okay? Um, but we'll have to do well. We'll have to do well. Be next week. Yeah, we're well, just we've as done, outrageous. We've done a bit on well, we haven't we? But yeah, maybe maybe next week we've got a good article. So anyway, just to say, Reverend Doctor Bernard Randall uh, is in our prayers, and we wish him all the best. And um, may, we may even be able to get in touch with him. We, we hope we, we're able to. Anyway, so I, I thought I'd just go for this email, and then we'll do we'll do some notices at the end. So this is from uh, Michael. So thanks, Michael, for getting in touch. And one of the reasons I like this email is because he starts with a quotation from uh, Iron Maiden. The evil that men do lives on and on. I'm sure you know that song, Tom, the evil that men do. Classic mm -hmm. made in tune. So he writes, I listen to many podcasts covering a variety of topics on the science, policy, direction of travel and religious aspects of the current scandemic, his words, not mine. And it's heartening to observe that lately the emphasis on Christ being the root out has been prevalent both here and in podcasts from the USA. The fight back from Christians in the USA seems to have, been, have far greater energy than in the UK. And once again, we may need to invoke US help or inspiration to rescue us from the latest form of tyranny. I, like many, effectively abandoned Christ in my youth. I was born in the 60s and was brought up in the times when many of us were still going to Sunday school. Assembly and hymns were sung at school prior to the start of lessons. My parents had lived through World War II where communities were so much more important to everyday lives than they are today. After leaving home to go to university, I really only attended church for weddings and funerals. I was in pursuit of the great life ahead that was promised by the free university education of my era. God and Jesus became increasingly unimportant in my life and I was seduced by the idea that since there were so many religions all claiming we come from a higher power and to that we shall return I felt it better to simply believe in the universe um, as being the God that the religions refer to in different ways yet looking back it's those who have passed away my dad and favorite auntie have shown me that they took more comfort by staying close to Christ in their latter days I've almost reached that point in my life Yet I don't know how to return to Christ. It's been so long that Christ has been in my focus. I think, I don't know what he means by that. Uh, maybe he means it's been so long that Christ hasn't been my focus. I'm not sure. I've reached a point which I feel is quite common amongst people of my age group, whereby we want to return to Christ, but don't know how in, in a meaningful way. The Great Reset wants to keep us in fear, with him claiming to be our saviour from climate, COVID, and many other fake hobgoblins they can dream up to prevent us from knowing that Christ is our real saviour. The elite want to show us that they and not Christ are our saviours. This is no different to many other instances in the past where their evil risks being undone by those who find sanctuary in Christianity. In effect, Christians are their enemy. Yet I don't have an answer to how to properly return to Christ, and this email is reaching out to you to guide me. I'm sure that many people feel like me. Can we fight their new world order ideology with a better ideology, i.e. Christianity and humanity? The elites fear Christianity as they know it will undo their evil goals, and that's what keeps them awake at night. Evil takes many forms, and they're not always obvious. It manifests itself in many different ways. For example, it's the conversation that you have with a 21-year-old student who believes that there are hundreds of genders, not just man and woman. The evil behind this is taught in schools. It's hidden. The evil that men do lives on and on. 
It just takes less obvious and more sinister forms in the modern world. Yet we must fight it in the same way by putting our faith in Christ. And I'm reaching out to you in the hope that you can guide many of us lost souls like myself who turned away from Christ many years ago and wish now to get back to the truth. Mm. Wow. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. We're too busy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> got to do some... Got to do some... I've got 700 graves to look at. Uh, <laughs> do you know what? So, tell me, sorry, pass you on to maybe someone else. Do you know what? I, I have an I have. So if you want to do this, um, you can, and anyone who, who who's in the same situation can, because um, I was I was a Methodist once, and they have something called the Methodist Covenant Prayer, and I and I just think that if you if you want to turn from your life and turn to Christ, there's very little better, and I'm sure Jamie can chuck a link in. Because can I? Do you mind if I read it out, Jamie? No, it's lovely. I have a rule of life group in our parish. Yeah. We read it. So right. I'll just read it out now. Because if you if you pray, you want to pray this with me. Um, it sounds like I'm doing an altar call now. I'm, I, I am. Really uh, then oh, then yeah. then, go, then, Tom, go then do it. it. It goes like this. It's called a covenant with God. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Puts me to doing, puts me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours so be it and the covenant now made on earth let it be ratified in heaven amen 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 wow. yeah. that's the uh, i think st ignatius wrote something very similar in that. and in, in in many ways it's those kind of prayers demonstrate that as humans we're we are meant to have wings yeah, this is how we fly. In the the best world. thing about it, Daniel, is is where that bit you are mine. You know, that's such a statement. You know, I, you, God, you are now mine, and I am yours. You know, but that there's there's a, there's an ancient history that, that as we approach God, we become God. It's called theosis, and it's 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 hard. It's a very hard thing to understand. But this idea that we possess Christ and Christ possesses us. You are in me as I am in you. He said. Um, you know, we are we are the we are the fruits, and he is the vine. Mm. Um, so, you know, as as if if you are not sure how to commit yourself to Christ, uh, just just pray that prayer, and and then if that doesn't work, we'll try something else next week. Yeah. But um, you know, God <laughs> bless you. <laughs> I, I mean, one of the um, one of the sort of scriptural points I'd go to here, I think, is thinking about uh, the Apostle Paul and the way that he spent so much of his life engaged in what was essentially fruitless um, activity, worse than fruitless, per persecution of the church. And then he had that wonderful conversion on the Damascus Road when Christ appeared to him and he realised uh, effectively what, what a great sinner he, he was. And um, one, of my, one of the scriptures I really love, I mean, probably my favourite book of scripture is the letter to the Philippians. And one of the things that um, Paul talks about is, there's a very famous passage where he talks about um, that the gain he had, he counts as loss for the sake of Christ. And he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And he talks about the way basically he's lost all, all the status and the, the glory that he had with being a sort of high ranking, um, high ranking uh, Pharisee. And he says, you know, all that he wants to know now is the righteousness from God that depends on faith to know him and the power of his resurrection. And then slightly later on, he says, um, I've not already obtained this. I'm not already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in, in Christ Jesus. And I think there's such an important thing in, in the Christian life is that we do, we do have regrets. And, and some people have terrible regrets, you know, that they've wasted so much of their lives or they've done something awful. But the fact is, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a point of our faith that because we're, we're forgiven by Christ for the things in the past and we now, have a, we now have a future, God calls us to a future. He calls us to say yes to the future that he's given us. We can't be held back by the things which are in the past. And so we have to, in a sense, forget the past 
I mean, there is also a sense in which we, we should also look back and be thankful for aspects of the past, but when the past drags us down and causes us regret and sorrow, we have to, we have to forget it and, and strain forward to the future. And so with, with, um, with Michael who writes in, and um, you know, with other people who feel that they're in this situation, God calls you to a future. And that future is so much more significant than, than the past that you've left behind. You know, the future is, the future is of eternal significance. And so, you know, absolutely embrace Christ, you know, forget what lies behind, strain forward to what lies ahead and, and grasp the goal, which uh, grasp onto Christ as he leads you towards the goal. Um, that's, 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 um, that's the best I can do, I think, from, from, yeah, from I think, thing. you know, you think of the name Michael, my, my, it's a powerful name, you know, from yeah. Revelation, Archangel Michael, you know, that this is, this is the, um, the manly angel, you know, who, uh, combats evil, yes. head on, you yeah. know, so be confident in your name, Michael, that yeah, you've been absolutely. given you, you, know, you were given that for a purpose. And I think to many of our listeners who may feel an oppression from you know, what's been happening with lockdowns, with anxiety, with fear, um, with maybe their own mental health, the physical health, with fear of the future, whether we're going to be reset, you know, um, the various schemes and plans of men, um, maybe a feeling that their vote counts for nothing. Uh, that prayer that Tom has given us, I think, is our route map to saying, cling on to him, and then you will see all these other things uh, as the chat uh, in, in comparison to you know, yeah. the, the glory of Christ. You know, uh, we can't give that experience to you. We can only invite you to grasp hold of it. It's like walking into the storm with the belief that there is the iron storm, there is the peace that passes all understanding. Yeah. You've just got to make that act of faith and walk into it. Yeah. And grasp, is it King George the Sixth, isn't it? His famous prayer about put your hand out into the darkness and God will God will grasp it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That um, scripture, by the way, I'm not sure if I said wh where it is. It's in Philippians chapter three, if you'd like to, if you'd like to read that particular portion of scripture. Um, so thanks so much, Michael, for, for writing in and, um, and for your, for your um, honesty and uh, the interesting content of your email. Um, chaps, let's just finish with uh, a few notes, notices and then we'll say a, a quick prayer. Um, you might remember Edward Dowler, who's the Archdeacon of uh, Hastings. Um, he is doing a lecture at um, Pusey House, which is a college in Oxford, um, which is on the uh, May the 19th, and it's called The Church and the Virus. Uh, it's the Peter Toon lecture, May the 19th. It will be, it will be streamed on Zoom, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes yes. to, to this. Uh, this is going to be a good lecture about, about the church and the virus. It's not going to be the same old rubbish. Mm -hmm. So, um, so d if you're interested in a cleric who's actually got something to say, which is worthwhile listening to about, about the coronavirus in the church, I uh, highly recommend uh, mm -hmm. tuning into that and uh, watching it, um, or however you're supposed to. So I'll put, I'll put the link to it, um, to, all, uh, um, to, the, to the lecture on, on the show notes. Um, but the, the, the episode you did with him, where he quoted Joseph Ratzinger, Pope yeah. Benedict's um, exegetical piece on 666, I thought was extraordinary. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, I've read, I've read, he, I've read, he's an extraordinary voice to him. Yeah, yeah, I've read quite a lot of this lecture. He sent me a copy of it and it's, it's very, very good. Um, so, so that's that. Um, also, if you'd like to listen to some of our sermons, we put a sermon up every week. So uh, irreverendsermonaudio.buzzsprout.com. Uh, so that we'll put a sermon up this week. We haven't decided whose it's going to be, but there'll definitely be one this week. Um, if you'd like to support us, um, you can join our Patreon community. Um, you can do so for as little as uh, £3 um, per month, plus yeah, VAT. Pounds. So £3.60, yeah. So um, plus VAT, um, which is 20%. So it's £3.60 uh, per month if you'd like to support us and join our Patreon community where... We sort of um, we sort of hover a bit more in an intentionally way intentional way to um, to so that we uh, can connect with people, um, 
and um, it'd be great if you if you want to do that. That'd be really really good. Um, I'm not going to do any shout outs just because I need to leave in about a minute. But we'll we'll do some more shout outs for for patrons next week. And then um, finally, um, if you'd like to send us an email, and your email may very well end up being the email of the week, uh, do uh, send an email to irreverendpod at gmail.com and we receive all those emails and we read them um, sometimes we don't have quite enough time to reply to all of them because we get an awful lot um, but we do read them all and uh, as I say we might end up reading out your email on the show for email of the week uh, so those are all the notices unless there's anything else that any of you chaps have to add nope no no okay so um, well should we finish with a prayer who'd like to do uh, who'd like to do a prayer this week Shall I do one? I'll, I'll do one. Okay, you do one. Do one. Do one, Daniel. Okay. Go for it. Uh, well, this is a blessing prayer, and it's one that I often use to conclude liturgies, particularly on saints' days. Uh, may God, who has called you to holiness, draw you unto himself. May you hear his call to take up your cross and follow him, knowing that he who says this also says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. May you know that he carries you. May you know that his grace seeks to enlighten and lighten you in that path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you evermore. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Daniel. And so thanks everyone for listening. Thanks to everyone who's emailed. Thanks to all our patrons. Um, and thanks to you, Daniel and Tom, for, uh, for being here and for such an interesting conversation. And I uh, look forward to doing it again next time, for sure. Okay. See you again soon. Bye now. Goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye.